In a game chock full of colorful levels and worlds like Super Mario Odyssey, it's important to have strong musical themes to accompany the visual cues and create an overall identity for the level itself. The importance of audio and visual cohesion is somewhat subconscious in nature, meaning that while we probably don't realize it ourselves, our brains associate the visuals we see with the music that we hear. That's why most people have preconceived notions of what music should accompany certain level styles. If we see a fire bass level, we expect to hear instruments like sitars and tablas. We associate them with heat in the real world. In the same way, if we see a snow bass level, we expect to hear sleigh bells and strings. The point is that we always have an expectation for music in video game levels. Breaking that association and trying something new is often risky territory for a composer, but it breaks up the monotony of typecasting certain locales with specific musical tropes. Let's see how Super Mario Odyssey both fulfills those expectations and shatters them at the same time in a musically interesting and refreshing way. First we'll look at some of the levels which use the typical musical tropes for their locales. Toss Arena is the second world in the game and it's the usual desert level you find in pretty much every Mario game. Why is it always World 2? In Toss Arena we can find plenty of examples of the normal instrumentation and compositional traits associated with desert areas, both surface level and slightly more subdued. The first thing to note is the chord progression the music in this section is built around. 1, flat 7, flat 2. This chord progression is derived from the Phrygian scale, with the flat 2 chord in particular often used as a calling guard for both exotic and desert themed sounds. While the piece doesn't stick with this chord progression for its entirety, much of the main section is built around it even after it changes key. The final section makes use of a 1, flat 2, flat 3, flat 2 progression, and other series of chords common to this style of composition for desert themes. The melody itself doesn't stick with one scale in particular, but a lot of it comes from the Dorian flat 2 scale, a scale common to Assyrian music. It's the second mode of the melodic minor scale, and this works well with the harmony, as the only difference between this scale and the Phrygian scale is the sixth scale degree. This gives the melody more of that exotic flair that is oh so common in desert themed levels and worlds. And while it is kind of cliche at this point, that doesn't mean it sounds bad. It also plays a big part in preventing the melody sounding too dark. This is a Mario game after all, not a horror one. The instrumentation is also fairly typical of this style of music and level theme, with the usual distinct flavour that generally arises in the music of games in the Mario series. Outlining the harmony we have both an electric guitar and an acoustic guitar playing power chords, root and fifths, with one of my favourite pieces of guitar writing being the heavily reverberated low melody the guitar comes in with. The rhythm section is then filled out with hand drums, sounds like djembes, bongos and dimbek playing a driving rhythm which keeps the music pushing forward. The melody is carried by lots of ethnic wind instruments, typical choices from melodic instruments with writing in this style. The melody itself is decorated heavily with ornaments to further enhance the authenticity of the music and create more interest for the listener. A little bit of Marioness enters when a synth carries the melody before we enter a percussion break to loop back to the beginning of the piece. With Tost Arena, we can see our first example of music that traditionally fits with the visual themes in which it accompanies. The music doesn't really aim to break any new ground within this kind of level theme, but it's still interesting and enjoyable while fulfilling the most important rule music can have in a level, amplifying what the player is experiencing on screen.
Next, let's look at one of the two water levels present within the game. This one being the second of two which you encounter. Bubbling features a nice interpretation of a bossa nova in that distinctly Mario-esque style, with a combination of traditional genre-specific elements and aspects more unique to the Mario sound. Bossa nova is the style of jazz that was born in Brazil and popularized in both the 1950s and 60s. Well-known bossa song that you might even know is called The Girl from Ipanema, a jazz standard. One of the most defining characteristics of the style is the distinct rhythmic pattern employed, which goes a little something like this. Bubbling isn't a slave to this pattern, it does have its own distinct rhythm, but it is clearly derived from the parental rhythm present in Bossa Nova. Harmonically, the music also employs the usual jazz tactics, with making pretty much every chord at least a diatonic 7th, with the A section being built around a 1 major 7 to 4 major 7 of amp, the turnaround of the end of the section using the 3 6 2 5 progression. I like how the composers choose to alter the progression by changing the 3 chord for a 1 in first inversion and the 6 for a diminished 7 chord. This makes the music a bit more interesting and emotional to listen to. One other thing is how they use a flat 7 chord as a substitute for the 5 in certain places, a nice touch that makes the music a wee bit less predictable. The melody really has that laid back beach vibe going on with the constant switch between straight and triplet rhythms. It just makes you feel like life is lazily passing you by. The targeting of certain chord extensions at the end of phrasing also helps to emphasize the shade of color in which the music aims for, with the 13 over the B flat 7 chord being one of my favorites. The B section then contrasts the A section with the introduction of a mode mixture from the parallel minor key of E flat minor. With the C flat major 7 chord entering to inject a new color into the music in the Mario style. Then we move to a sequence of 2 5 1 4 progressions, another standard move in any jazz style to bring us back to the home key of E flat major and allow us to cadence on a B flat 7 chord, creating the loop point for the music. Due to fluctuating key signatures of this section, the melody introduces much more chromaticism into the music, a final flare before we return to the top of the piece. Like Tostarina, the music of Bubbling really goes for capturing the feelings the game wants the player to experience in its composition. I don't think Bossa Nova is an overly common choice of style for music in video games, especially not in the Mario series, so it's nice to see the composers beginning to branch outside the usual tropes in search of great music while still serving the needs of the level. I can't be the only one who was really excited when they first entered Bowser's Kingdom. With how sanely the Bowser castle levels can get in the Mario games, it really was a massive breath of fresh air to see Bowser's Kingdom done in a clearly Japanese style. The music is no exception to this, although it is more of a fusion of both Japanese and Western musical elements to satisfy the expectations we as listeners have. The instrumentation of this piece includes many traditional instruments using Japanese gagaku music, 
such as the shamisen, shinobue, and wadaiko drums. Like I said, these instruments are accompanied by more Western musical instruments, mainly a string section, trumpets, and French horns. The harmonic identity of this piece is crafted around a chord progression of E5, F5, G5, F5, and back to E5, a chord progression more typically associated with Middle Eastern and desert level musical troops. This is combined with a melody based around the E natural minor scale, using more of the Western elements to build contrast for when more of the harmonic and melodic Japanese ideas enter. The way in which the composers introduce these more traditional Japanese ideas comes from the melodic sections and scale choices. This high melody we hear is an entry point, as it is built around the use of the Hirajoshi scale, a scale commonly used in the tuning of koto for traditional Japanese music. One of the really interesting things about scales in Japanese music is that they're generally all hemitonic, pentatonic scales. Try saying that five times fast. This just means that they're five note scales with one or more semitones in. The interval structure of this version of the Hirajoshi scale used consists of The choice to place the root of the scale on A also creates some sense of polytonality, with music in two keys at the same time, though this effect is mitigated by the relationship of the melodic notes to the underlying chords. There's also a fairly dissonant and tonally ambiguous section towards the end of the piece used to emphasize the inherent danger and challenge present. We can't forget this is a Bowser level after all. Before we loop, this bridges back into the Japanese-inspired melodic content with more inherently Western chord progression to complete the musical fusion of the piece before we loop back to the beginning, ending the musical journey through cultural tropes before resetting and playing it once over. Now with Bowser's Castle, we can see our first clear departure from the musical norm. While the music is obviously super appropriate for this awesome level, it's completely different from what Nintendo usually goes for with music in the Bowser's levels. Welcome change for most players, I'm sure, even if they're not consciously aware of it. This is about as far as the composers will go while still maintaining musical tropes within levels, so what's the next step in that case? I'm not even really sure what label to use in order to describe the musical style of Steam Gardens. Laid back, retro surf rock maybe? Anyway, forest levels generally tend to feature lots of acoustic instruments, traditionally one of the few remaining locales that feature woodwinds in order to evoke nature and the natural world. Steam Gardens goes pretty much the opposite direction and gives us an up-tempo grooving piece featuring guitars, electric bass, breakbeat drums and tasty Hammond organ licks. After a big orchestral intro featuring the typical Mario kids of flat 6 to flat 7 to 1, the band enters and we move to a 1 minor 7, 4 bump with horn stops. The rhythm and syncopation in both the bass and the horns really helps to drive the music and create a sense of forward momentum, contrasting the usual ambient and magical tropes usually associated with music in forest levels. The main section of the music then features a 1, flat 3, flat 6, flat 7 progression, a chord sequence that has a really strong inherent sense of emotion. This coupled with the melody played on guitar sounds just great, and I can't really think of a way to describe it other than just cool. Before we hit the chorus, another progression worth mentioning is the flat 6, flat 7, 5, 1. This chord progression is completely inescapable in music written by Japanese composers. 
listen to literally any anime opening and you'll find it all over the place. The melody itself is primarily based around the E minor pentatonic scale, with the organ lines featuring the use of the flat 5 scale, the Greek and the blues scale. The horn accompaniment and the organ solo at the end also use the natural 6 in a minor key, making our parents scale the E Dorian mode super common for fantasy and adventure music and predominantly source of what I described as cool earlier. The combination of all the notes commonly used in the melodic content therefore consists of the following. So with Steam Gardens we can see another example of non-trope based music composition, the music being clearly different from what people usually expect this kind of level to be. Stylistically, you'd think there would be a massive disconnect between what you're seeing and hearing, but it actually works really well and it's refreshing to hear something different compared to what is normal for these types of levels. Chivaria is an interesting case as it combines both atypical ideas for the locale with tropes that are common to it, creating a sort of musical fusion that represents the level orally while also being refreshing to listen to. I like to think of the style of this song as wintertime in Ireland or Scotland, due to how clearly influenced the music is by Irish and Scottish folk music. You can think of the piece as either a jig or a slide depending on how you want to meter it. I choose 12 here for readability's sake, but it would also work really well in 6-8 time if you choose that. The harmonic conventions of this piece are almost entirely diatonic, helping to add to the snowy and somewhat Christmassy vibe the music goes for. Of course, being influenced by traditional music as I mentioned before, we do break into some mode mixture from Demixolydian when we enter the B section. The contrast of these two harmonic identities creates more diversity and tonal interest in the music. Finally, we introduce some darker tonality by moving towards the relative minor of B minor before we approach the coda and loop point. This injects even more direction and harmonic colour into the music. Overall though, the music maintains the happy atmosphere you would expect from both the level and genre of music that we associate with both Mario and Christmassy music as a whole. As a lot of the harmony within the A section remains static with the constant D pedal in the bass, so much of the movement and the harmony is outlined by the melody. As is typical in this style of music, the melody focuses mostly on strong chord tones throughout, which both outlines the harmonic direction while solidifying the style of the piece. Another key aspect is the use of melodic ornaments throughout, the most consistent and obvious one being the use of mordants at the end of each melodic phrase. The syncopation is also a key aspect of the melody as it helps to drive the music forward and maintain the bouncy and dance-like atmosphere, very appropriate considering the most common types of both Irish and Scottish traditional music are for the encouragement and accompaniment of dance. The instrumentation, like I mentioned before, features the use of traditional instruments such as frame drums, vipple flutes and the violin representing one side of the music's identity. The other side of this comes from the use of instruments commonly associated with Christmas, the most obvious being the use of high metal bell signs and the completely inescapable use of sleigh bells. 
The fusions of these two musical instrument choices really crafts a strong identity for both the music and the level in which it accompanies. Shiveria presents a colourful and interesting use of musical fusion to complement the aesthetics of the level itself, with a combination of both traditional and Christmas musical elements. The familiarity and trope-based composition obviously arises from the use of instruments associated with Christmas, while the more unique aspect of the music emerges from the style in which the music is written, Irish and Scottish traditional. And lastly, we have Mount Volbano, the volcano slash lava level for Super Mario Odyssey. Obviously, that's only one aspect of the level. Being called the Luncheon Kingdom, the other defining trait of this area is its association with cuisine and culinary delight. The visual choice ties into the music as well, with one of my favourite quirky ideas in the music being the use of what sounds like percussion using kitchen utensils, a nice touch, and adding a way of tying the music to the thematic material of the level. The music itself in the level centers around some of the staple musical ideas commonly associated with mountain and volcano levels. Lots of percussion, both tuned and untuned, and a strong driving rhythm used to symbolize how solid and unmoving these kind of locales are. A lot of the energy in the music is generated from these elements as almost the entirety of the A section centers around a static A7 tonality, the apparent scale of the music coming from the A mixolydian mode. It isn't until we reach the B section where we see the introduction of more harmonic motion, the inclusion of many power chords again symbolizing the rugged and raw nature usually associated with these kinds of levels. One other aspect of note is the use of what I like to call the Venetian calling card. Tremolo mandolin or another similar stringed instrument used to evoke a stereotypical Italian sound. This ties in with the music of Peronza Plaza, the style of which very clearly aims to create that stereotypical Italian sound I mentioned. Almost all of the harmonic motion in this piece is generated melodically, with the melodies and counter melodies introduced in the music outlining the chord structures almost throughout the entirety of the piece. With our A section melody, we can clearly see the use of the Mixolydian scale as the base of the piece, the root being built off the note A. The Mixolydian scale is commonly used in both adventure and fantasy music like the Dorian mood, as it generally provides a sense of forward motion and atmosphere appropriate without sounding too overly happy a problem that the major scale or Ionian mode sometimes has. I do like the juxtaposition of acoustic instruments with synthetic instruments. The marimba and xylophone calls being answered by a more synthetic flute sound gives the melody its own character without being out of place within the style of the music. Finally, I do like the deceptive resolution we hear near the end of the piece with the end of the melody. The harmonic and melodic movement sets us up for a typical Mario cadence, but instead of walking up to the one chord in the current key, the chord progression slides back down to finish on the A7 chord. This is so smooth as the A7 is the 5 chord in the key of D minor, which is the key center at that point. The Mixolydian mode is also sometimes known as the dominant scale, as the 7th chord built off the tonic is a dominant 7, meaning that the return to the vibe of the A section at the end of this modulation is incredibly smooth overall. Mount Volbano is another level in which the music falls in between the typical level music and more distinct ideas. There is just enough familiarity in the music for what the player is expecting, while also introducing some new and unique elements to craft a unique identity for the level through its composition.
In a game with such strong diversity in both level and visual design, creating a piece of music that's both interesting and complements the level is a fine line to walk along. I think the composers did a fantastic job in negotiating this problem while writing incredibly catchy music that is distinctly Mario in style, another aspect you can add to the list of requirements for the music in the game. While I only talked about a few of the songs in the game, you'll find most of them also fit this archetype if you analyze them on your own, with a few exceptions. Break Free Lead the Way springs to mind as Mario Odyssey starts to feel more like an anime than a video game at some points. Not a bad thing, though. Anyway, I hope you learned something about how important music is alongside visuals and setting the tone and crafting an identity for a level, whether it be stereotypically trope-filled or a fresh and interesting take on the concept. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.